and Beth said, I am talking today about dragon bones in Chinese medicine, the herbs and legends. Alexis, if you want. <laughs> so, there's a, an amazing history behind Chinese medicine. Um, the herbal knowledge starts in the Eastern Han Dynasty with the publication of the Divine Husband, Husbandman's Classic of the Materia Medica. It's also known as the Classic of Materia Medica, which is what we've studied from. And Zhang Zhongjing, he wrote the discussion on cold damage and essentials from the Golden Cabinet just after the fall of the Han Dynasty. His work is the source of all prescription manuals that we use today. And the classic of Materia Medica is, is his first book to focus on descriptions of individual herbs. Now, when I say herbs, what are you thinking of right now? Ginseng. Okay, plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, in oriental medicine, herbs comprise much more than plants that are grown in the ground or shrubs or trees, and we'll touch upon that. Besides Materia Medica experts, this group included astrologers, geomancers, magicians, and technologists. So there was a lot to Chinese medicine. Some Chinese medicine providers take the time to study all these different disciplines. They've hopefully had 30, 35 years of practice and had a lot of time to do all kinds of personal studies, continuing education studies, and so forth. Um, legend attributes the authorship of the classic Materia Medica to the mythical divine husband, husbandman Shen Nong. And in addition to in introducing agriculture and animal husbandry, he is said to have tasted the hundred herbs and thereby became the legendary patron of herbal medicine. If you can imagine sampling a hundred herbs in one day, oh. toxic and non-toxic, you might be quite Sick, but you learn a lot through sampling herbs. This medicine is based on empirical knowledge through trying, experiencing how it affects them in their body. Hmm, that's interesting. When I take that mint, it calms down my digestion. I was running hot before I had that mint tea. Now I'm noticing I'm cooling down. That feels pleasant. I'm not sweating. I'm not overheated anymore. Great for somebody who runs hot who might have what we call yang rising essential hypertension. Um, also, it would be good for cooling your spirit. If you're feeling hot-headed, you want to have more mint to just sort of remind yourself of the sweet things in life because mint has sweet properties. So, I'm going to stick to this because I want to quote precisely. Um, there are botanical 252 entries Mineral, 45 entries, and zoological, 67 entries, substances in oriental medicine. And many substances now used today in traditional Chinese medicine originated in places such as Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, and the Americas. Now let's first touch upon plant herbalism. Now it's not until the late Sui, is that correct pronunciation? Sui, S-U-I? and early Tang dynasties that we find a truly comprehensive discussion of herbal characteristics. Materia Medica of medicinal properties, Xiaoxing Ben Cao discusses the subjects of the combination, the reaction of the herbs together, the taste, the temperature, whether it has any kind of toxicity, the function of that herb in the body, and the primary clinical application, the actions and indications of why we're even going to suggest those herbs to our patients and how to correctly process that herb and then how to prepare it in your kitchen or at your office if you have granules, if you have bulk, you're gonna decoct it in a big pot on your stove at home and so forth. So what's important for you to know about plant herbalism is, is there's five major designations used to describe the temperature characteristics of herbs. First, we have hot. Secondly, we have cold. Third, we have warm. Fourth, we have cool. Fifth, we have neutral as far as temperature characteristics of our herbs, what we're intending to do to somebody's body. If they run hot, we want to cool them down. If they run cool, we want to warm them up. It's all about balance. Uh, homeostasis, as you would say in naturopathic circles, but balance is simply the simple explanation of what we endeavor to do with our patients. The other primary property of herbs in traditional Chinese medical literature is taste. 
how does that herb taste? There's five tastes. Acrid, sweet, like in the mint tea that we're serving this morning, <coughs> or this afternoon rather. Bitter, sour, and salty. Who here eats dandelion in their bowl of lettuce? Dandelion leaves. One person. Do you classify that as sweet? A oh, bitter. Bitter. <laughs> Would you, who's, who's trying the mint? Are you guys trying the white peony? Tea? Okay. And um, you are welcome to try the mint as well once you're done with the white peony. Let's talk about mint. In Chinese pinyin, we call it bo he, and it disperses wind heat on the body, clears and benefits the head, the eyes, the throat. So if you have a hot, scratchy, sore throat, mint tea is excellent for that. And if you have patterns of wind heat, if there's a lot of wind and it's the temperatures and the environment are heating up and you're experiencing a cough, maybe headache, red eyes, sore throat, mint tea, anything mint in your dishes would be an excellent choice. It vents rashes, so if you had an early stage of measles, mint helps release the exterior. And <coughs> Mint also allows for constrained liver chi. What do we mean by constrained liver chi? What we mean is stress. Tight muscles, tight tendons, holding yourself tight over the computer keyboard, typing for six hours, got to get the project deadline met, or driving for a long time, truck drivers, any kind of drivers, long road trips. That's why it's important to get out and stretch and move your tendons, move your ligaments, move your bones, right? So if you have pressure in your chest or flanks, mint tea will help with that constrained liver chi. Another herb that I want to talk about is bai shao and shi shao. So Alexis, if you want to read um, the two descriptions first, which one do you have first, bai shao? Bai shao and then translate it in like an English terminology or botanical. Oh, okay. I didn't have the function, go for it. Okay, it uh, nourishes the blood and regulates menstruation. It calms the liver down rising and preserves and exchanges the skin structure. And it balances the eating and weight, which are the nutritive and sensitive layers of the tissues. And it nourishes the liver down. So liver young rising can be where the temperature in our body is going up, the young is rising, we have red face, bloodshot eyes, maybe we have essential hypertension, high mm -hmm. blood pressure. That is liver yang rising, and the liver yin's job is to anchor, to pull back down that liver yang that's just floating upwards. We want to balance between the yin and the yang. Okay. And Trishel? It moves the blood and dispels stagnation. It clears the heat and it cools the blood. And it clears the liver fire. Liver fire is a perfect example of Beet red face, bloodshot eyes, angry fixation. That's a liver fire. You'll notice that when somebody's really angry and having a horrible argument with someone, and they're just red in the face and like their eyes are gonna pop out. That's an example of liver fire in observation. Chinese medicine is based on observation. When we have a patient come into our treatment facility, we are talking to them, asking questions. We are looking, observing their face, their eyes, their skin. Um, whether they have circles, dark circles under their eyes, um, uh, bruising, the obvious, like you would in Western allopathic medicine, does that person bruise easily? Are they possibly anemic? Or is it some other cause for their bruising? And um, so, conversely, we'll notice if someone's incredibly pale, like they're blood deficient, like they need some foods or Chinese herbs that will build their blood and give them that healthy, rosy, tone in their cheeks like their healthy blood levels. Okay, so to read about Chinese peony, it's native to China, Korea, Manchuria, Siberia, and Japan. The plant is commonly cultivated for the attractive flowers as well as for medicinal purposes, which I just had Alexis read. The parts of the plant that are used are uh, the roots, and it's an intestinal antiseptic. It promotes the expulsion of phlegm. It increases menstrual flow, if a woman's flow in and flowing in a nice flowing way, it kind of starts and stops, floods, what have you. Um, it can also increase urine flow, so if you have had any kind of urinary tract infection, if a male has prostatitis inflammation of his prostate, not necessarily prostate cancer, but he's noticing 
uh, decline in the flow, decline in the output, any kind of dribbling, this herb will help you. It um, helps treat cholera. Back in the days when we had cholera epidemics, tuberculosis, general weakness, vomiting, and stomach issues. And then the next one that I want to talk about is Fan Hong Kwa. Question about peony. Is it any kind of peony, or is there a certain uh, Chinese variety of peony? peony? Like I wonder if some of these peonies here from China. I wonder if they would be medicinal. They, they are. Yeah. They are. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just focusing on the Chinese peony variety. I see. So Fan Hong Kwa, also how we know it in. Um, Indian cooking, or, or maybe even Spanish cooking, I would say more so Spanish, um, if you're making um, paella, or go to a restaurant and order an amazing dish of paella. I can tell you the top restaurant in Portland that I've had the best paella is um, Toro Bravo on Northeast Russell by that Legacy Hospital. Oh my god, they make, and you can share it. You can have, share it with a friend, share it with a spouse. Paella dish for two, it's out of this world. So saffron is sweet, and cold in its properties. Saffron enters the heart and the liver organs in Chinese medical theory. It invigorates the blood. It dispels blood stasis when we worry about blood congealing or pooling in our blood vessels. Maybe we're sedentary, we're not active enough. This helps invigorate blood. It also cools down the blood for someone that runs really hot, maybe a diabetic who has what we refer to as stomach and kidney yin deficiency. They're always hot, they always want cold, icy drinks to cool their body down. This will help cool the blood. And I recommend, I wrote down the dosage, I'm taking it straight from the Materia Medica book, not that I'm prescribing to you here today, but just this is an example of what it looks like inside the Materia Medica. This is contraindicated during pregnancy. You don't have saffron during pregnancy because it's so moving to the blood, you wouldn't want to move the blood and move the uterus cause any unwanted cramping before the full term of the pregnancy. Um, so if there's a woman that's experiencing menstruation and she has stagnation, the blood is congealing, it's clotting, it's not flowing as it should, this helps move the blood during menses, which would help relieve her pain. When blood flows out nice and natural, the pain goes down. It's when blood gets static, stasis, stagnation, that we experience pain, whether it's in our muscles or the uterus cramping what have you. Um, if you combined saffron with curcumate, radix, eugen, for a fullness and stifling sensation in the chest and the diaphragm due to emotional distress, where someone has so much stress going on in their life, their emotions are just coursing through them and they feel this tightness in the diaphragm, hard to get a full breath, you would combine those two together. So Fan Honghua was first used medicinally in China during the Yuan or the Mongol dynasty. And proper and essential things for the emperor's food and drink says it masters constraint and accumulation of the heart being upset so that the qi is stifled and does not disperse. Long-term ingestion causes a person's heart to be happy. Which is, it's timely that I mention something that makes your heart to be happy because we're evolving, we're transitioning, right, from spring season into summer season. I don't know, maybe you think we're in summer, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I suspend belief that we're really in summer. But in the summertime, the two organs that we focus on in Chinese medicine are the heart and the small intestine. Spring, we've just been focusing on the liver and the gallbladder organs. Tendons, sinews, ligaments, if you have tendon issues, you pulled a tendon. Spring is the perfect season to address it with herbs, acupuncture treatments, uh, food therapies. Very, very helpful to nourish the liver and nourish the gallbladder. But in summertime, we're going to nourish the heart and nourish the small intestine. Let's go on to the next, which is um, now we're moving on to animal herbalism. Okay, muli is oyster shell, as we would think of it in English. Muli is salty. It's astringent, so what do we mean by astringent? Let's say somebody has excessive urinary flow, um, sweating like crazy, we want to astringe, we want to hold those fluids in that are just excessive. Peeing all the time, sweating all the time, we want to astringe the pores so that they're not losing all their body fluids, which we refer to as yin or yin, as we would say in just English street talk. Um, Muli, the oyster shell, is entering the liver and the kidney meridians. Okay, so that's helping your tendons. It's helping your genital region. Kidney, which is bones, 
the marrow of our bones, our brain, our low back, our knees, our hair, that's all kidney. Hearing, being able to hear is good, strong kidney energy. So mooly oyster shell would be good for your hearing. It'd be good for your liver, which means when we're helping support the liver, we're supporting the eyes. Liver channel goes right to the eyes. Again, I recommended the dosage taken right out of Materia Medica. That's the jurisdiction of the licensed acupuncturist to decide how many grams for that patient. And it needs to be cooked first when it's used in decoction. So you cook the oyster shell first, and then you add the other herbs that are combined into that formula. The cautions and contraindications would be you don't use muli in cases of high fever due to excess with an absence of sweating. And an overdose of muli would simply lead to indigestion or constipation. The actions and indications of why we use muli in a patient, it's a heavy settler. It calms the spirit. Somebody that has palpitations and anxiety, muli is an excellent herb, right? You're like, what herb? You're talking about a shell from the beach. Muli is an herb in Chinese medicine. And for somebody who has insomnia, right? Okay, we have patients come across our threshold that have insomnia. I volunteer with the Portland Veterans Acupuncture Project. I am treating dozens of men and women, spouses and veterans alike, or maybe both of them are veterans in some cases, that have insomnia. So Muli would settle down their spirit, help them to anchor the yang and calm down and go into a nice, deep, peaceful slumber. The next herb that I talk about, now we're going into the discussion of minerals in Chinese medicine. Se shu is magnetite. I'm sure you've seen this in jewelry stores. Yeah. A silvery kind of oh, yes. charcoaly colored yes. metal is magnetite. Mm -hmm. I had a friend make that for me. I had a completely magnetite bracelet. It was so heavy looking and the energy didn't feel right for me, so I asked her to soften it by throwing in other glass beads and not so much heavy magnetite. It is considered acrid, salty, and cold in terms of the properties in the body. It enters your kidney and liver meridians as well. It's going to sedate and calm the spirit. It anchors the yang while it's nourishing the true yin. So in a case of like hypertension or somebody, maybe I'm going to give an extreme example, and you might have somebody that's bipolar or they're just in a manic phase and they're going, 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 or they're shopping, 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 reckless shopping to the point where they're going to run themselves into extraordinary debt, or they have a million and one of brilliant ideas and they just can't settle down and focus on one project at a time. That you see that in bipolar patients, and that patient just like that. I would give Sosha Magnetite in a herbal formula for somebody like that to calm them down, calm their shen. When every time I say shen, I mean spirit. It also improves acuity of hearing and vision. So for somebody who notices that their elders in their family, their grandparents or their parents are exhibiting signs of hard of hearing, you might want to be taking these kind of things under the guidance of a licensed acupuncturist or a certified herbalist to promote wellness and to pr prevent any unwanted pathology later on in life. If you're worried about hearing being an issue family-wise, you're going to do what you can to support your kidney and liver energetics. And the only uh, contraindication for this is magnetite is used with caution in cases of a weak spleen stomach. So somebody that has irritable bowel syndrome or a lot of digestive problems, they can't seem to break down their foods when they go to the bathroom and, and if they do ever look at what comes out of them, is there undigested food? Is there diarrhea? Are there loose stools? Excessive, you know, going to the bathroom numerous times a day are signs of weak spleen stomach. Somebody that has acid reflux, right? The stomach chi is rebelling upwards. Stomach chi is supposed to go down. It's supposed to go this way. Spleen chi is supposed to go up. So they sometimes get into complete turmoil and they go the opposite way. And that's the job of an acupuncturist is to get it correct the chi in those two meridians. You're going to bring stomach chi back down. You're going to help the spleen chi to ascend. In cases of organ prolapse, organs that are sinking, uterine prolapse, rectal prolapse, those are all signs that the chi is descending. So we're going to do herbs, food therapies, and stuff, and even points at the top of the head to help the chi to go back up. And it sounds goofy. It sounds like, what? Your pins in the top of my head is going to really make a difference? It does. If I put little tiny pins in the crest of the woman's shoulders, 
when she's at nine months of pregnancy, this descends the chi downward and it sends the chi right down to her uterus to help those contractions get going when she's at full term and ready to have that baby. So that's where acupuncture techniques come in, and that's not what we're talking about today, but depending on how you put in a point, where you put the point in the body, it has intention, whether we're trying to lift the chi, bring the chi down. Case in point, somebody that comes in and I've done blood pressure cuff on them and their blood pressure is off the charts, too high for acupuncture needling. I'm going to do points on the bottom of their feet to bring that chi down, right? Because it's coming up to their head, their hypertension, red face, red eyes, gets angry easily. We need to settle that chi back downwards. And magnetite would complement that treatment. It would settle things down. So you do points prescriptions and herbal and food therapy prescriptions with intention of what are we trying to accomplish in somebody's body. Chuan Chie, pharmaceutical name Scorpio. You're thinking I'm talking astrology. Chinese uh, practitioners do study astrology, but right now I'm talking about the scorpion. Um, it's salty, it's acrid, it's neutral, and it's toxic. It enters the liver meridian. It strongly extinguishes liver wind. It stops spasms and pain. So somebody that might have uh, Parkinsonian tremors, unwanted muscle tremors. We might administer a very tiny dosage of scorpion in their formula to try to strongly extinguish that liver wind. When I say liver wind, it's when the hands are going, or the limbs are spasming out. Um, and because the substance is toxic, it's always used with caution, and you never exceed the recommended dosage. You're always very conservative on how much of Chuan Xie you put into a formula. It's contraindicated in patterns of wind associated with blood deficiency. So if somebody's showing tremors and they have signs of blood deficiency, they're pale, they have maybe dull, achy headaches, those are all signs of blood shoe, blood deficiency. We're not going to give this herb to that particular individual. Also, it's contraindicated during times of pregnancy. And the contemporary physician, Xiao Xi, Fong describes his experience with this substance. Animal medicinal can be used in the treatment of stubborn headaches, according to the dictum, for early stage disorders are in the channels. Long-term pain has entered the collaterals, where you have actual acupuncture channels or meridians, and then beyond that, we have what's referred to as collaterals. So if you are a, muscle, if you are a massage therapist, I might say your fascia, your soft tissue, near the actual acupuncture meridians. Does that help you to understand what I'm saying when I talk about collaterals? Um, and this herb can be added to the original prescription to unblock the collaterals and stop pain with good results. Of these, Scorpio is an essential item. The scorpion tail is especially effective in trying to achieve that result. So I'm going to send around the Chuanxie. The herb dispensary just gave me one little guy. They, they were so kind, they let me smell the jar. They opened it up and put it right under my nose. I got a good whiff of it. Woo, strong. In fact, when I got back in my hot car yesterday after these herbs had been sitting on my passenger seat, my whole car smelled like this little guy. You could smell, you could smell the salt, and I don't know if they use, do they use preservatives or strictly dry? I'm not sure. Sometimes they do. It depends on the so I don't know if it was strictly the scorpion odor from the heat of the car or a little preservative also that I was detecting when I sat and I opened my windows to air it out. The next one animal herb that I want to talk about is wugong. In English, we call that centipede. It's acrid, it's warm, and it's toxic. It enters the liver. It extinguishes wind, stops spasms, seizures, and convulsions. So for somebody with epilepsy, we might actually put together a Chinese herbal formula using some wugong, some centipede. It would be finely ground into a powder. They wouldn't even see the centipede. They wouldn't see all the legs. Finely ground, probably put in a tiny muslin bag that's steeped, just powder kind of dissolves into the tea with all the other ingredients, and it's going to help stop those epileptic seizures or spasms. This substance is toxic also, and it should also be used with caution, and it's never used in a large dosage because of its toxicity and it's obviously contraindicated to anybody who has pregnancy. So here's a Wugong. I tried to get an example of Gecko, Go Jie, and they don't have it right now. Um, back when Beth and I were students between 
2005 to 2008, we had a gecko that just looked like a little Jesus figure, and his legs and feet were out, you know, like he was on on a cross or something, you know, just totally stretched and dried out. So I'll never forget that passing around the good GA, the little gecko. So I want to talk to you about something that I'm passionate about as it relates to plant herbalism. How many of you know somebody that has diabetes? How many of you think that there is a problem with diabetes in America? Okay. When I studied and wrote a paper for the masters, I wrote about treating diabetic peripheral neuropathy, meaning the peripheral nerves that get damaged from diabetes from years and years of high blood sugars damaging their nerves. And there is a plant that I'm absolutely enamored with. It's Mamortica carantia, also known as bitter melon or bitter cucumber. Anybody ever shopped at Fubon Asian Market on Southeast 82nd? Oh yeah. They have bitter melon tea, and they actually sell the real bitter melon. It looks like a little spiny, thorny cucumber. You can slice it up, you can work it into Asian stir fries. Just so long as you have seasonings that are very strong, maybe a nice oyster sauce, soy sauce, um, Chinese five spice, you're following me, that's just some strong flavors and seasonings so that you're kind of doctoring up the dish and you're not overwhelmed by the taste of bitter melon, but it is outstanding at balancing blood glucose levels. Um, and it's heavily researched in Japan. They use a lot of bitter melon in cases of diabetes. Wouldn't it be nice if we saw America converting from all this metformin and glyphosate drugs to more vegetables in their stir fries, like bitter melon or cinnamon in their brown rice or cinnamon in their oatmeal in the morning or lime juice, lots of lime juice throughout the day to balance those blood glucose levels. So I endeavor to try and educate my patients a lot when they come in with diabetes and start introducing food therapies to them, natural Chinese herbs that are, and supplements that you would see in a naturopathic circle that help balance the sugars quite a bit. Okay, so let's just read what this says about mint, mentha. The generic name comes from the Greek name of nymph, mint. Mints, of which there are many, are used, usually cultivated for their aromatic essential oils contained in all parts of the plant. The field mint, a native of northern hemisphere, is a hairy perennial herb, easily recognized from its aromatic leaves. Flowers are small and lilac, they're white and sometimes pink. The Japanese mint, which is a variety of species, is an important source of menthol. I actually will use peppermint oil on my patients right here when they come in with a temporal headache. It helps release the exterior. Unbelievable. I put that in. I mean, I put that, apply it right here or maybe back by their occiput if they're having one of these occipital style headaches. And then pop in two points, large intestine four, which are great for headaches. Or depending if it's a temporal headache, I'm going to do more triple burner channel or gallbladder channel, which is Xiao Yang. This is the lesser Yang part of the body. The most Yang is the back of your head, right? And if a farmer was farming all day, working with his plants and agricultural crops, his back is facing the sun. That's the most Yang, brightest, warmest part of your body. The front is the most Yin part of your body. The lower part is the most Yin. The upper part of your body is the most Yang. How many people just drive around Portland and notice beautiful magnolia trees? Magnolia is used in Chinese medicine. It will help deal with the exterior of the skin. When we talk about flowers, we think of them as light, floating, not heavy, not dwelling down deep in the ground like roots. So flowers are going to address more superficial conditions, skin, and so forth. So, I'm just trying to see if I can notice any other herbs that I, I marked a couple pages that of um, hydrangea, believe it or not, is used in Chinese medicine. And it's a beautiful flower. We take it for granted. It grows in coastal areas. It grows here in Portland. Enough water and enough sun. And then I marked what I really want to talk about the, the weed that we look at all the time in our yards and we mow it down and we pull it out. <laughs> what am 
I talking about? Dandelion. Dandelion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You'll always touch money no matter what you do. So. so just for fun, I wanted to share with you an actual legend, because that is part of today's talk, is the legends, dragon bones of Chinese medicine, herbs, and their legends. Asian dandelion is referred to as fisherman's herb, pu gong yin. So every time you look at a dandelion, I want you to remember this talk and realize that those are beautiful things in your yard and you shouldn't eradicate them. Let's hear Next question before I go into the story. Who here knows anybody or has personally been touched in their life by somebody with breast cancer? Or knows that Susan G. Coleman in the Relay for Life that we're seeing all around town, all across the country is about breast cancer. So the story goes, the 16-year-old daughter of government official in ancient China was suffering from mastitis, which is just inflammation in the breast tissue, with a triangular lump underneath her left breast. She was in pain and was becoming very worried, but she dared not tell anybody about it because deep down inside she felt very ashamed. But her disease was subsequently found out by her maid, who disclosed it to her father, pleading with him to hire a doctor. On inquiry into his daughter's condition, the official became very angry as he suspected that his daughter must have done something immoral to have caused it. He rushed to his daughter's room and began to strike her in the face. How could you do such a shameful thing? You are a disgrace to your family, shouted the father. The maid insisted that his daughter had never gone out and could not have possibly done anything immoral. The father wouldn't listen, and so the daughter ran away from home that night out of shame and desperation. She went to the riverbank, and thinking that no one around her at that hour would see her, she quickly jumped into the river in an attempt to commit suicide. However, a fisherman was fishing from a rowboat nearby with his 16-year-old daughter. When they heard the splash, the fisherman's daughter instantly jumped into the river to save her. Once they were both on board, the fisherman was surprised to see that the girl was just about the same age as his own daughter. The fisherman's daughter began to change the girl's clothes. In the process, she discovered the swelling in the young lady's left breast. At that moment, she immediately understood the reason for her attempted suicide. After telling her father about it, the fisherman replied, we will go dig up some plants for her breast first thing in the morning. The plant turned out to be a perennial herb with white milky juice in it, yellowish flowers, and straight but fleshy and thick roots. They found the plants on the roadside not far from the river. They dug out a few plants that were about 100 grams in weight, washed them clean, and boiled them in the water. Then they told the girl to drink the liquid. In the meantime, they crushed some of the plants and applied them to her breast externally. The way that we do that in Chinese medicine, we will do topical applications of certain herbs depending on whether we have a swollen ankle and we're trying to clear the edema or mastitis in a woman's breast after she's been breastfeeding, we will put on topical herbal packs, internal and external. Upon hearing of the whereabouts, and the attempted suicide of their daughter, the official and his wife, feeling greatly worried and deeply regretful, rushed to see the fishermen to take their daughter home. Their daughter, grateful and in tears, said goodbye to the fisherman and his daughter said goodbye to the fisherman and his daughter and went home for, with her parents, bringing a bunch of the plants with her. Before she left, the fisherman kept reminding her to continue using the herbs for her illness. After she had recovered from her illness, she had told her maid to plant the herb in the garden so that she would always remember the fisherman. She named the plant after him without knowing his name. So Pu Gong Ying translates to me, fisherman's herb. So this herb, the whole part of the plant is used, the leaves, the, the stem, the yellow flower, the roots. It's considered bitter and sweet. Its energy is cold when we think of mastitis. It's inflammation, it's hot, it's aggravating to that woman's breast. It's a heat sign, so we're gonna want an herb to counter the heat with some cool properties, cold properties actually. So it helps to reduce excessive heat inside the body. It's meridians that it affects are the spleen and stomach channels. The spleen comes up to the lateral breast tissue just below the axillary or armpit region. Stomach channel comes up right through the middle, mid, clavicular line or nipple line, this is the stomach meridian. So these two meridians are addressed by this particular herb. We're trying to move the chi that gets stuck, cool down what has gotten hot on those particular channels on the body. <clears throat> so it clears up heat, counteracts toxic effects, disperses any swelling, and heals what we call carbuncles. 
Experts have shown that pugang yin can be used for breast cancer, and that it is an antibacterial herb. It contains folic acid and bacteria, bac bacterides, and it is now being widely used to treat mastitis, hepatitis, appendicitis, urinary infections, acute tonsillitis, tracheitis, laryngitis, and the common cold. In addition, pugang yin can also regulate the liver and the stomach, which is why it can be used to treat mastitis and stomach ache. So that, that would be relevant to every time we see this Relay for Life and Susan G. Komen and raising money to find a cure. There are actually some food therapies and herbal therapies that women could be doing if they have signs of breast cancer and also if it runs in their family, maybe they could be getting dandelion leaves into their salads just a really yummy, flavorful, strong dressing, I would say, because it's a bitter, bitter, you've had it. Oh, but I love bitter things. I'm yeah. so grateful to them. But you eat it for your liver. Yeah, the yeah. average yeah. American I want to taste the bitter. Yeah, that's I good. It. That's good. That's <laughs> very good to balance, because in the typical American diet, we like salt. A lot of people crave salty things, chips, you know, anything that's salty, and also sweets. Like, people love to have Sweets, ice creams, cakes, cookies, sweet drinks. It's a wonder why we have epidemic, epidemic amounts of diabetes. And sometimes when life becomes hard and difficult, we want the quote unquote sweet in life, metaphorically. So just remember that you can have that sweet item to remind yourself of the sweet in life, but also make sure that you're working into your diet some good bitters, like these bitter plants. Can you just take dig up a dandelion plant and put everything of the plant in water and boil that? Yes. And then drink it? Yes. Tea? Yeah, roots. Yeah. Leaves, stem, flower, and then just strain it off so that you're not getting all that. And obviously wash it really well. Oh. And if you're picking it along the highway, wash it really, really well because of all the exhaust. Yeah. And then it's amazing how you'll be just driving along the roads and you just see dandelions run amok. And I just said, oh my god, that's like food therapy. I could be using that for my patients. I just need to wash it really well. Yeah. So roots also have inulin in them, which is a prebiotic. Or, I mean, yeah, uh, a, yeah, a prebiotic for probiotics. Mm -hmm. It feeds the probiotics. Great. Thank you for sure. I didn't know that. Dandelion root, that's a great tea. Mm -hmm. They sell yeah. it in stores. I've been taking that for 20 years. So. They probably even have it for the Myers by now. They definitely have it in New Seasons and Whole Foods. Whenever my dog gets constipated, I, I pull up the root. I wash it off and I put chew on it, and it really just tears things apart. Really and it's it's fascinating to me when you watch dogs, dogs and cats just go up and graze on certain plants. They know, and they're drawn to the smell of that plant. They kind of know it's a medicine, and they use it as a digestive. When dogs and cats are chomping on grasses and stuff, they're trying to cleanse their digestive tract from toxins and things in their food that wasn't necessarily the best for them. Okay, the next herb that I really wanted to share with you today is Chinese hawthorn, mountain hawthorn, what we call shanja. So I'm going to pass around the jar. This is dried shanja. It's been sliced. Um, I had a field day one day. I was at the Hoyt Arboretum and I just looked at hawthorn tree under hawthorn tree. And they have such a tremendous variety here at the Arboretum. Beautiful, different colored berries, depending on what variety or species of hawthorn it is. And, um, I'm in love with this particular herb. I'll tell you. I'll share the legend and then we'll go into what it's actually good for. A 40 year old businessman was once married and had a son. Two years after his wife died, he got married again to a cunning woman who disliked his her stepchild and wanted to get rid of him. What is the best way to do it? She pondered. I can't kill him, nor can I poison him to death because people will find out. After her husband left on a business trip, she decided to take some action against her stepchild, who was almost 10 years old. Her stepchild worked in the mountains every day, and she always brought, back, brought him his lunch. While her husband was gone, she intentionally prepared his lunch with half-cooked rice, with the hope that he would die from indigestion. Really nice lady. <laughs> After a few weeks, the stepchild began to complain of indigestion and was starting to lose weight. This pleased the stepmother, and she continued to make him lunch with half-cooked rice. One day, the stepchild happened to find a tree growing with plenty of berries. He picked some berries out of curiosity, ate them, and found them delicious. These berries seemed to quench his thirst as well. He began to feel better and continued to eat the berries every day, gradually putting on weight. 
What is happening to this child, the stepmother asked herself. He is not dying. On the contrary, he looks much healthier. Maybe God is protecting this child. Being fearful of God, the stepmother stopped making his lunch with the half-cooked rice. When the businessmen returned home, he learned about the berries from his son and decided to market them to herbalists in town. So we call this Chinese hawthorn, or in scientific name, Crataegus, and I have a hard time pronouncing this second one, Pina, Pina Tifida, I can spell it for you if you'd like. Uh, the part that's used is the fruit from the tree. Its flavor is sour. Let me tell you, if you put more than four or five berries decocted in a cup of tea, and your tea is pucker sour. So I, I do about four or five tops, and I mix it in with green tea, or I mix it in with some other flavor tea, so that I'm getting more of that other flavor. And I even will smooth it out with a touch of honey, because of I'm a typical American, I don't like a lot of sour, and I don't like a lot of bitter. The actions of Shan Jad eliminates accumulations in the body, promotes energy flow, and disperses coagulation. So if somebody's had thick, greasy food, or a big old Thanksgiving dinner, and they've eaten way too many courses of a meal, and they just feel food stagnation, that's when we use Hawthorne fruit Shan Jad, because it helps move that food accumulation through your digestive tract, and you eliminate it. According to experiments, Shanja is an effective heart tonic, and it can activate the blood and bring down blood pressure. It is effective as a digestive, it can treat fatty liver, and it can also reduce blood fat. Shanja is a strong herb for transforming food and eliminating food stagnation due to indigestion. It is particularly effective for eliminating meat indigestion. If you have a big heavy meat meal and you're just going, ugh, distended and bloated like the meat's not processing, have some Shanja and you'll feel relief. Shanja can activate the blood and remove blood coagulations. It is often used in conjunction with Dong Gui and Yi Mu Sao to treat pain in the lower abdomen and lopiostasis. That is when the um, lopia of the fetus has not expelled properly from the body and it will help clear that stasis. I like Shanja because it can also help lower cholesterol. I can't tell you how many patients we're seeing that are on statin drugs, things to try and pharmaceutically lower their cholesterol levels, right, to prevent unwanted stroke. Stroke is now the greatest risk in America. It's surpassed heart attacks. How many of you knew that? That stroke is now our greatest risk in America compared to like myocardial infarction, heart attacks. So start learning to love Shanja Hawthorn right from Oregon. It grows actually on the East Coast as well, but we have plentiful Hawthorne berries, Hawthorne fruit here, and you can buy it at Wigman Herbs on Southeast 82nd. You can get Hawthorne tea. Is the, is the from Wigman, is it, is it the local berry? That's a good question. I don't know their supplier. Um, <coughs> but the jar that I sent around was I'll put in five pieces of fruit in with my tea. I'll put in more pieces of fruit in a big pot of soup. It smells great. I love it. All right, does anybody have any questions on that? Go ahead. There's a huge hot dog tree in Oregon, uh, back across the years ago. The time we dropped, dropped the little red bird, it's about the size of a pea. And I noticed that the birds don't seem to eat it. Um, the squirrels don't seem to get at it. Um, so I thought maybe it wasn't edible, but you're saying that these, these are edible, but they're very sour. They are very sour. Can I ask a question? don't make jelly out of them or anything like that. Not that I've seen, but that. <laughs> I could make hot thorn fruit jelly and market it across new seasons and Whole Foods and pay off all these student loans. <laughs> no, you should, it's your idea. You have to take it and run with it. So, what other herbs should uh, support the heart since we're moving into summer now? Um, you said hot thorn. What else is good for the heart, herb wise? Uh, or food wise? Look up herbs for the heart, please. I'm not, I don't have that all at the top of my head. Or this would be potassium, potassium foods, right? <clears throat> if you're asking about potassium foods, what springs to my mind right away are bananas, oranges, and orange juice. I would actually have the whole orange versus the store bought orange juice, which is just loaded down with sugar. Right, right, yeah. It's fine if you have a diabetic who's really low in blood sugars and you've got to get their sugars up really fast. You put a little cup of orange juice in your mouth and get them to swallow it. It raises it like that. So, 
we'll have an answer for you here. Would that be like Ginkgo? Ginkgo is like circulation. Would that be the heart also? Could be. We could um, see also if you can find Ginkgo in there. I don't know that one. I, when I think of Ginkgo, I'm thinking of nourishing the eyes and the brain. Um, it really enhances blood flow oxygen to the optic nerve. Um, so um, I've given two talks over in Beaverton at different assisted living facilities about treating eye disorders with Chinese medicine. There's a formula that I love giving to patients of mine that have eye problems or eye floaters. They see little brown specks in their field of vision. Um, it has ginkgo biloba, it has zeaxanthin, lutein, and bilberry. They're all incredible antioxidants that helps clean up the free radical damage on the blood vessels in the back of the eye, mm -hmm. back by your retina. And that's where you'll start to see people with years and years of high blood sugars uh, start damaging the backs of their eyes, their retina, macular degeneration, whether it's wet or dry type. It's nasty. So eat your antioxidants too. You know, all those wonderful, beautiful uh, colored veggies, the red bell pepper, the orange bell pepper, the purple onions, purple cabbage, slice that up into your summertime cabbage salads with broccoli. Broccoli is a great antioxidant. You'll be helping your eyes into your 70s, 80s, 90s, 100s. Right? We're all going to live to be 100, right? If we, if we eat well and we move our blood and we laugh a lot, we should be able to have a good long life. Did you find a section? No. Okay. Beth, I got a pop question on herbs that are good for heart. Since we're going to huh? heart. What do you mean by heart? Heart and small intestine organ for summertime. She just asked a generalistic question. Would that be like ginkgo? We talked about hawthorn. Well, um, it would depend upon the particular issue. The one that first comes to mind is for uh, Don Sal, the um, dry organ syndrome, where you get kind of irritable um, and weepy, and that would be Don Sal, the mm -hmm. one that uh, Don Sal, the British, Fu uh, Mai, which is immature wheat.
or a Fred Myers to buy a bottle of turmeric spice and start working it into their dishes, working it into their brown rice and their, I just get the um, coconut oil in the pan and I'll put in a whole one to two, two teaspoons of turmeric. And then I start sauteing purple onions and then I start throwing in maybe meat, we cook that the longest and then the, the lighter veggies, red bell peppers, orange bell peppers, bok choy, greens, really beautiful greens to offset the red and oranges. It's a beautiful dish and turmeric, well, you know, you could use turmeric on tofu to substitute if you can't eat eggs to feel like you're having scrambled eggs one morning and it just makes the dish look beautiful. I've served that at brunches so I gave some people the option of real eggs and other people the option of tofu seasoned with turmeric and it kind of looks like the color of scrambled eggs. Um, I adore turmeric. It's one of my favorite herbs. Is there any is there any such thing as you're taking it too much and you need to lay off of it? So I take it not every day, but if you're really showing heat time. signs, if you're just really getting heat signs, really getting flush. It's a warming herb. Oh, I take it year. Oh, so not so great in the summer. So if you were really getting red, red in the face, or okay, you would so not back so much off in the and not have that much. Um, so it's fabulous. Or love it. For those of you that want to try another um, herbal therapy, can you use the handle of the strainer to just sort of divvy out a little bit for a cup? I'm going to warn you, for those of you that you cannot have any kind of alcohol in your diet, please don't try this. If you've had breast cancer and you're abstaining from alcohol but you don't want to risk factor of getting it again, please don't have this. But if you can have alcohol in moderation, you can try this. It's goji berry that's been decocted in a potato vodka for a long time, for years. It's very potent. You're really going to get the taste of alcohol out of berry. Um, I would have maybe four or five little berries per day. Gochitsa, goji berries, which you can buy in these seasons in Whole Foods kind of stores or in Asian markets, is outstanding to support the liver and the kidney channels when you have eye disorders. You have eye glasses, contact lenses. You're noticing that your eyes are aging as they all do when we get older. Those of us that are reading or at computers and having eye strain, you want to nourish your eyes. Goji berries, not decocted in alcohol, just decocted in a nice tea, are outstanding for your vision, outstanding for your eyes. Um, they are very good for some woman who might be going through perimenopause, early menopause. You want to nourish her kidney and her liver yin. A woman that's going through menopause is going to be running hot. She's sweating, she's having hot flashes and night sweats. She's losing her yin. Her yin is her body fluids, right? She's sweating it out because she's running warm. She's flushing all of a sudden right in the middle of a meeting or right in the middle of singing out at a club. I've seen this. I've seen musicians suddenly flush in the, mo in the midst of a menopausal hot flash, and I just wish I had some yin herbs for them right there to <laughs> cool them down and, and moist, you know, give them the body fluids that they're, restore their body fluids. Um, so goji berries, um, you would also use gochitsa for ears to, to support both eyes and, and ears. It's, it's strong, so I'm just letting you know it's been decocted for a long time. What about just eating the dried berries? Is that you can chew them, just we affectionately call it the Chinese red raisin. Ah. So just work up enough saliva in your mouth so that you can moisten that very, very dry, small piece of fruit. And just suck on it for a while and chew it down like a raisin. You can soak it in water for a while, soften it, so it'll be more like the consistency of a raisin. I throw a bunch into my pot of tea because I, I have a eye issues. I have nearsightedness. I can see great up close, but when I'm driving or in the, I was at the movie theater last night, I had to sit close enough to be able to see the screen and all the details on the film. So that marigold, exotic marigold, oh, so was a good. wonderful, wonderful oh, movie yeah. again. Wow. I don't listen to the critics anymore. <laughs> it was fun. If you'd like to try those, they, uh, they garnished the big tofu in the uh, tea house right behind us. We had some for lunch, so. Wow. Quite familiar. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, just be aware that you are in control of your health. You can be doing plants and teas and foods and exercise, just walking, just out looking at the plants, walking over to a neighbor's house, just 
moving your blood. That's all we need to do. We don't have to become triathletes and major marathoners and going around Mount Rainier or from the hood to coast, which if you do that, that's great. But if you're just moving your blood, you're doing yourself a world of good. I just walked on the treadmill this morning for a good 40 minutes so I don't have to sweat. So kind of, because springtime, you're detoxing, you want to have a little sweating action. Or do you think it's summer? <laughs> I'm still confused. What season is it? I guess June, technically, it's summer. July 4th, but we're summer. Yeah, June 21st. Yeah, I call it January. <laughs> More winter than summer, but it's, the flowers are out. Yet another plant with another function. We use Siberian ginseng for fatigue, edema, and rheumatic disorders, so rheumatoid arthritis, sore joints. You would want to try some Siberian ginseng under the guidance of an herbalist. One minute left. Does anybody have questions? So what's the name of that? The book, the story, the Legendary Chinese Healing Herbs by Henry C. Lu. It's very fun. Yeah, it sounds great. Because, you know, will you remember uh, Pu Gong Ying now? Dandelion root from the Fisherman's Herb? And uh, the horrible story about the mother-in-law trying to hurt her stepson by giving him the uncooked rice and the way he made himself better by it was by going and munching on hawthorn berries because it cleared that food stagnation of the uncooked rice. So it's a great book because the stories help kind of anchor the knowledge about the herb. This is a nice book as well. This is in the Ocom Library, an illustrated dictionary of Chinese medicinal herbs and you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. You know, there's a wonderful herb shop, well, it's called the Herb Shop on Hawthorne, run by a naturopath, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Roger, from um, NCNM, mm -hmm. uh, 34th and Hawthorne. That's a great place. Oh, yeah. yeah, she's yeah. got everything. And they're all organic. All the herbs are organic. Yeah. Which that's a big deal. You see them want pesticides or sprays on them. Yeah, I'm horrified to think, you know, that some of the herbs aren't organic at these seasons. You know, I just can't imagine. If you email me any of your questions, I will take the time to research answers for you. Any questions that you think of after the talk, oh, I will look up things for heart for you. Okay, sorry. Thank you. And we also have Oregon College of Oriental Medicine information here. This school is outstanding. I think it is a Harvard of the West Coast. I'm very pleased with the education that we got there. The school is moving to Chinatown, as you can see. It's coming September of 2012 here in Old Town, Chinatown. It wow. is a beautiful facility, absolutely beautiful. Is it being built? Is it a new building? Or are they it's, it's a historic building that they've renovated. And Beth could tell you more. She works at the college long hours and knows every little update. Or just about. Yeah, we won't be moving in. I think we have occupancy in July. Mm -hmm. So we'll start moving all of our material in. It's essentially finished. So if you walk, it's about two blocks away, right over there on Second Street, which has got a big oak on China on top, and we'll be there starting in the fall. Clinic and a dispensary on the ground floor, and public classes like this, and we'll keep doing this as well. Good. Yeah. So feel free to take the information, and thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Are you a naturopath or? I'm a herbalist.